Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Devoratorium. My name is Darnay DeVore. Once again, I'm going to be your host. On today's episode, we'll be discussing You Can't Take It With You. What do you love? What do you love in this world? For some people, it's money. They love having money. And honestly, that'd be nice to have. All the money in the world. I, I don't mean just, oh, I've got enough money to buy a house, a big house, or two houses, or and, and a couple of cars. No, no, no. I mean the money to buy yourself your own island, all right? Your own island with boats, uh, cars, and uh, planes, a, heli, a helipad where you can land your personal private helicopter. You can afford anything you want to. Think about Jeff Bezos, you know, the Amazon dude. Uh, I think he's worth 200, close to $200 billion now. That dude has got more money than he can, than he can spend in several lifetimes. That's a lot of money. But let's say money is not your thing. For some of us, it's power. We want power, control. You think about all those politicians that like to influence people or have control or power over people and, and their decisions and what they do. And that's what drives them. They're passionate about that. They, they pursue that to no end. Then also, let's think about uh, love. Maybe your what you love most is love itself, being loved or feeling like you're loved. And I know some folks, men and women, will do anything for the person they love, uh, whether it's moral, legal, or otherwise, okay? They are so desperate to hold on to, to, to that love that they perceive uh, is the center of their existence. These are three of the top things, money, power, and love that we all focus on so much problem is that you can't take it with you. You cannot take any of that with you. Let's take a look at Luke 12, 20 through 21. Now, the context of this is there's a rich man who uh, he enjoyed a bountiful harvest. All right. He had all these barns where he put all his harvest, his grains, his, his, his produce, everything that he had was in these barns. But the barns weren't big enough uh, for the produce, for the harvest that he had that particular year. So what he was going to do was tear down his barns and build some bigger ones, bigger storehouses to keep more of his stuff. And, and, and he, he mentions that now, once I do that, I can relax, eat, drink, not work. I can just take it easy. The scripture reads as follows, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Folks, that's a very powerful statement. We're going to hold this just a second here. Very powerful statement because uh, then who will get what you have prepared? Your, who, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Bottom line, God is saying you're not taking that stuff with you. You're not. You are rich towards yourself, but you are not rich towards God. That's a big deal. That's a very, very big deal. But the, but the concept of this is the same. You cannot take it with you. You're not going to. Let's take a look at Luke 16, 23 through 24. Now, this is the parable about the rich man and Lazarus. And I know we're focusing, focusing on riches, wealth right now, but you can literally transplant the word rich uh, uh, money wise, you can put in power, you can put in love, you can put in anything, anything that you, that you love, you can insert that in these parables. So the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man, um, obviously rich, the poor man, Lazarus was at his gate every single day, begging for scraps. The dogs were licking his sores. The rich man, when he would leave, he's got to pass his gate. He sees Lazarus there. Mm -mm. Doesn't matter. He's going on his business, doing his thing. Okay. So this scripture reads in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him. This is the rich man. He called to him, father Abraham, have pity on me 
and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. We're going to hold this scripture up for just a moment as well. Let's understand something. In life, this rich man could have, could, he could afford as much water as he wanted to. As much water, wine, whatever he wanted, he had the money. He was good to go. But here in Hades, he couldn't take any of that with him. And guess what? Now he's become a beggar. He is begging Abraham to send Lazarus down to dip uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. Oh my word. The rich man became a beggar. In both these scenarios, we see rich folks. There is nothing wrong with being rich, but there is something wrong with believing that rich physically on this earth is all there is to life and not having the heart or the compassion to give to others. All right. Not having someone tell you to give to others like some governments try to do, but having the heart and compassion to do it on your own volition. What kind of heart? In the case of Lazarus and the rich man, what kind of heart does it take for a rich man to walk past a beggar, a poor man at his very own gate day after day after day and not do a thing to help? Or how about the rich man with, with the field, with the, with, the, with, the, with, with the crops? How about that rich man? This rich man with all the crops, how, all the extra that he had, he was already rich. All the extra that he had in the harvest, he could have given away. He could have helped people with it, but he didn't. He was trying to figure out how to store more of it so he can relax longer, so he can uh, uh, work less longer, have more time for himself rather than helping other people. That's really the point of this, folks. You can't take it with you, but you spend your life uh, acquiring it and not having any compassion, not being rich toward God. James 4, 14, it says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Some of your translations may say a vapor. Your life is but a vapor that vanishes away. Either way, how long does a mist or a vapor, how long does that last? Not very long, does it? Not very long. But like I said, some of us spend all our lives building up um, to be to have the most comfortable, luxurious vapor or the mo most luxurious mist that 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 we can have, not realizing how quick it's going to go by, especially compared to eternity. In eternity, in eternity, we look back and we think of that vapor, the life we had, the life that we could have chose. God. We could have chose to be rich in God, but we instead chose to be rich in physical things, be it money, be it power, be it love, control, whatever it is. We chose to pursue those things rather than pursuing God. So what do you think will happen to you when you vanish? When, when you vanish like a vapor, when you vanish like, like a mist? What do you think is going to happen to you? Better yet, what do you think is going to happen to your stuff? Everything you've acquired, all the control, the power, the money, the cars, the jewelry, what's going to happen to it? It's going to belong to someone else. That's even from our first scripture. Uh, who will get what you have prepared for yourself in Luke 12, 20 through 21? Who's going to get that stuff? Now, you might will it to your next in line, your kin. Great. But then where, where, where does it go from there? Because they're not going to live forever either. It's going to keep getting passed down or eventually it's going to get passed out. It's going to get passed out. So all that you acquired won't really matter much. It won't really matter much in the long run. There's no VIP lounge in eternity. When you get to judgment, hey, God, I, I earned all this stuff in life. So I'm important. I belong in the important section. It doesn't work that way. There's no VIP section in death. And I've never seen a hearse at a funeral, a hearse with a U-Haul attached to it, taking all the, all your stuff with you. Never seen that. Now, the closest I think we've gotten as mankind is the pyramid, the pharaohs. All right. When the pharaohs died, they like to take all their stuff with them. 
So not only do they take their jewelry, their gold, their silver, whatever of value treasures that they had, they also took their servants too. Yeah, their servants were buried with them so they can keep serving them even in the afterlife. And what did that get them? All it did was it created movies like Indiana Jones where you see tomb raiders that end up stealing the stuff anyway, or it ends up in a museum, whatever, but it did not go with them. They tried, give them an A for effort, but it did not go with them. So why are we trying to do the same thing? Why are we spending our lives uh, pursuing something that we can't take with us? There's nothing wrong with having it, but to obsess with it, to make that your central focus, that's a different story. That's a different story. Me, I, I love, I, when I was a kid, I used to love toys. There's a store called Toys R Us. It's out of business now, but uh, Toys R Us, that was heaven for a little child. Can you imagine me going to the toy store and the, and the toy store owner says, hey, guess what I'm gonna let you do? You can grab any and as many toys as you want to in this whole toy store. Oh yeah, I'm going down every aisle. I'm getting all my He-Man toys, Transformer toys. I'm getting the bicycles, video games. I'm gonna grab everything I can. I can use one, two, 10 carts if I want to, tie them all together and I'm pulling them out the door because I, I, I'm going through the exit, right? I'm going through the exit so I can take this stuff with me to go home. But right at the exit, the string is cut and the basket stop. And I'm wondering what's going on. I want to take this with me. And the toy store uh, owner says, you can't take this with you. Grab it all. You can play with it. But when you leave, it stays. Oh, man. If you're not into toys, make it jewelry store. Make it a, a, a shoe store, clothing store, I don't, a car store, electronics depot. Don't matter what it is. Point is, take all you want, but you can't leave with it. Man, how does that make you feel? Makes you think, was it worth it? Was it really worth it? In the long run, that is. So um, I, I like to think of it like also there's a junkyard, okay? Um, I used to, when I got my first car, it was a 1972 Ford Maverick, all right? It was puke green. It was my first car, I was 18, and my uncle sold it to me, and I thank him for to this day for, for selling me that car because it was my first car, and to me, it was my baby. It may have been a piece of junk, but it was my baby at that time. So anytime it broke down, though, he would take me to the uh, pick-apart, the junkyard, or pick-apart yard, where we would go, and all these cars are lined up for miles, and you can pick any part you want to that you need for your car, off of the cars in a junkyard and you you pay like bottom line price you know you a couple of dollars for a new alternator you know just just ridiculously low prices but you pick it off the car parts my mind as usual just always works overtime and we will when we would walk through those aisles of cars these cars were stacked on top of each other and um and they were dirty they were filthy they were uh ransacked there were pieces missing on all the cars none of the none of the cars worked but I couldn't help but think these cars at one point were brand new. These cars, uh, some, some of them may have been someone's birthday present, someone else's first car, someone's anniversary gift. And these cars were loved and adored and polished uh, on a weekly basis. They were taken care of. They, it was someone's baby at one time and now it's in a junkyard. Now it's in a junkyard this is where all cars will end up in a junkyard. And I, that's when I started realizing even back then, yikes, man, the, the idea of new stuff eventually won't be new anymore. And eventually it ends up as junk, as junk for someone else. All right. If it remains treasure, it doesn't matter because when you're done with it, be it at the end of your life or not, you can't take it with you. And that's really the point. That's really the point today's video. You can't take it with you. Focus on the things that matter, the things that you can take with you, like your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can take that with you, okay? That's your spiritual treasure, is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Not the car, not the house, not the boyfriend, not the girlfriend, not the husband, the wife, not even the children. That's not your treasure in heaven. 
your treasure in heaven is your relationship with Jesus and how that how that reflects who you are here in the now. Thank you for hanging out with me once again today at the Devoratorium. You cannot take it with you. Keep these scriptures in your mind. Keep them in your heart. And I'll see you on the next video.